Hola, hola. Bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Voy a comparto el link rapidito para que se sumen las personas. Excelente. Nos veo súper bien en el stream. Todo bien por ese lado. Y vamos a darle solo un minuto mientras las personas se nos suman y empezamos en breve. Okay, Anthony, we, we should probably switch to English. Uh... You're right. You're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> we we were just talking in Spanish. Uh, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're just giving one minute so that people can join. And, yeah, we can get things started after that. Um, yeah, I think it's a good time maybe now. So, hi, and welcome to the June 2023 version of the community call, Rootstock community call. Uh, my name is Anthony Sanchez. I am the community manager at IOB Labs, and I'm joined today by, I'm joined today by uh, co-founder at IOB Labs, Adrian Edelman, co-founder at IOB Labs, Sergio Lerner. Engineering Director at IOB Labs, Jose Dalquist, Tech Lead at IOB Labs, Marcos Irrizarri. And yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, the agenda for today, we have the network upgrade uh, to Fingerroot 5.0.0, uh, the proposal intro, and there is some proposed RSK uh, improvement proposals. We have 252, which is the transaction gas price cap, 326, the pegout events improvements. 374, which is reestablishing the numbers of blocks confirmations for a PowPeg migration period. The 375, which uh, use the pegout creation transaction hash as the key in the map structure that stores the pegout transactions waiting for signatures. 377, which stores the last retire federation standard P2SH script. 383 uh, increases the migration activation age. 385, which is the bridge method, method improvement to the call you can see there. After the proposed RSK APs, we're going through a small Q&A section. So please feel free to share your questions in the comments below. And after that, we'll have a little bit of next steps. Um, again, before uh, getting into the, 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 uh, the big part of it, uh, please, if you want to get involved, uh, make sure to join the open Slack at developers.rsk.co uh, slash Slack. Um, I'll be leaving these links down in the description on YouTube, so make sure to check them afterwards. Um, yeah, uh, another thing you can do to get involved is ask your questions at the research and innovation channel within the open Slack. Uh, we also have the Rootstock Research Forum at research.rsk.dev. Um, you can also promote, uh, propose your own RSK IPs and discuss existing RSK IPs uh, in the public repos you can see there. We have GitHub, uh, which is slash RSK smart slash RSK IPs. And finally, uh, ips.rootstock.io. Again, these links will be shared on the description box in this YouTube video, so make sure to check that later. Um, just to go over what the aim, what the goal of these community calls are, uh, the idea is, of course, to have the community involved. Uh, please, everyone, feel free to participate. The comment section is open. Um, uh, the idea of, of this is to gather feedback, um, to discuss the changes to the rootstock consensus protocol. This is also the formal process for proposing improvements, and this will happen periodically. Uh, we've had them more or less every half year so far, but this is subject to change in the future. Uh, also, this is, uh, this is in place to discuss upcoming network upgrades. So yeah, uh, our next slide is actually Adrian. So Adrian, please, could you go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, as uh, Anthony was, was explaining uh, the goal of the community calls, uh, we uh, have submitted a, a network upgrade proposal and uh, we wanted to, to use this, this opportunity to uh, have some of the uh, engineers that design and, uh, and work on these features and improvements at IOB Labs uh, to describe uh, what these, what these uh, IPs are about. 
and uh, the rationale behind them and, and why they are they are important. And um, we also wanted to use this space uh, to hear from the community uh, either during the session uh, or most likely seeing afterwards uh, and welcome anyone to comment on the RSK IPs uh, and the uh, network capital in general. Uh, understand if the basically if the Russo community is in favor of uh, seeing this uh, upgrade happen or uh, if they find these protocol changes uh, controversial or need to clarify any doubts uh, or even propose any any additional consensus changing uh, changes um, so this call gets recorded uh, i guess will be available online uh, soon after we finish so uh, anyone can can check it out later and and share their comments uh, after this session as well. Uh, so uh, as Anthony was uh, just explaining, this is uh, everything is public in our uh, RSK Smart uh, public repo. So uh, that's where you can uh, share uh, your comments. Um, so so the scope for, for finger root, uh, which is the, the code name for this uh, proposed upgrade uh, is described in RSA IP 388. Uh, this is uh, yeah what is usually called a, a meta RSK IP, and it's it's a very simple one. It it serves mainly as an index to to each of the uh, proposed RSK IPs. Uh, it was published some days ago, and, and the idea is that it will remain open for comments for a few more days uh, until June uh, 14th. Um, Finger root is uh, it's not a big upgrade. Uh, it's pretty limited in scope, I, I would say, uh, and it's a uh, price of uh, seven improvement proposals that uh, will be uh, explained here today in this session. Uh, most of them are, are minor improvements to the POPEG. Uh, actually, six out of those uh, seven uh, IPs are related to improvements uh, to the Bitcoin Rootstock Bridge. But although it's small, uh, it's a very relevant one since the uh, main goal for, for Finger Root is to make uh, the final necessary adjustments uh, after the payout uh, outage that the network suffered a few months ago. Uh, so uh, the POPE composition changes can go back to, to normal. Uh, but this will, will be better explained uh, by uh, the guys here when we get to uh, RSK IP uh, 374, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Jan will will explain the rationale behind this, these proposals. Uh, they have led the, the engineering team working on the public for quite a long time, so uh, nobody better than, than them to, to go through this, uh, this uh, RSK in a few minutes. Uh, and the only RSK IP that is not public related is uh, RSK IP 252, which relates to uh, the transaction processing consensus rules. And we have Sergio here, co founder of Rootstock, who uh, proposed this first KP and, and will explain uh, why it's relevant. Um, so, yeah, so to summarize, uh, the proposal uh, will be open for discussion for a few more days until June 14th. So, uh, please share your comments in the RSKP or in the uh, research uh, forum uh, that we will share the link uh, later today in the in the window chat there in, in YouTube. Uh, so yeah, I guess, uh, Anthony, we are ready to start with, with the first uh, improvement proposal. Sure thing, I'll move it right away. It's a okay. big one. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yep. Please go ahead. Yes. So, so this is a uh, one that was proposed actually two years ago. I'm so happy that uh, finally we can activate this change because it's, it brings more security to RSK consensus. Um, uh, so th the idea here is that um, there is the, the, there is an attack that was actually the first form of minor extractable value that was was found. It's related to transactions paying very very high fees, 
And what it uh, generates when, when this happens is an incentive for miners to, instead of building on top of the longest chain, to fork the chain, to try to grab those high fee transactions and, and for their own for their own chains, uh, for their own forks. And this is called fee sniping. And this was identified like 10 years ago. So it's a very old attack. But um, when Rustock was designed, it was specially protected from this attack by a method called fee smoothing. It's actually the only blockchain in the whole uh, ecos uh, ecosystem that performs fee smoothing to protect from this attack because RSK does not have a block subsidy. So it's very important to be protected. But yet there is a small possibility to perform a, a, a way of this attack if you create a transaction whose transaction fees is 100 times higher than the, the actual minimum value. So there is still a possibility to, to perform some kind of attack uh, on the network. So what this proposal actually does is to cap the, uh, the, the, the maximum gas price to a multiple of the minimum uh, possible gas price, which is published on er every block. So this, this, this cap is 100 times. So actually that prevents any remaining form of fee, fee sniping that was relevant to, to Rustock. And also I think it has some other uses, uh, use, uses which is basically protecting the, the users for, uh, against their own mistakes. So in the early times of Rustock and any EVM chain, there was a lot of people doing transactions manually. And it was common to people mistake and, and pay huge amounts of transaction fees in, 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 uh, 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 when they wanted to send instead paying in transaction fees, like uh, this kind of mistake. So having a cap on the transaction gas price is actually a way to protect the user from their own mistakes or sometimes wallets uh, that are being developed. So it's, it's also good for users in, in this other sense. Um, yeah, this is all. And please uh, do comment on this proposal. Thanks, uh, Anthony. Awesome. Uh, up next, we have Marcos. So let's get to that. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, well, um, I'm going to present RSKP 326. Um, what this RSKP proposes is an improvement in the user experience uh, for users and also developers building on top of Rustock to be able to track the state of a pegout at an, an, any given time. Um, when a pegout is made in, in Popel, it goes through different stages. Uh, the, the payout is first uh, requested, then it's created, then it's confirmed when it has uh, enough amount of block confirmations, and it's finally signed and broadcasted. There are already some events uh, emitted at, at, at each stage, but this RSKP proposes a, a few improvements well, to, to improve the whole user experience. So. The first one is uh, doing an update to the PTC destination address field with this request receipt event. Uh, currently, that is being registered as the hash of the destination address. That is not very user friendly. The, the proposal is to store it as the base 58 address. It will uh, simplify knowing in which Bitcoin address the user should expect to receive their funds. Um, the second proposal is creating a new event called payout confirm. This should happen at the stage when a payout has already been created and has accumulated enough uh, difficulty on top, and now it's confirmed and ready to be signed. There is currently no event emitted at this time, and well, the proposal is to have this event so it's easy to track the, the state of the of the payout. And finally, a, and a small improvement is only emitting a signature event when a signature is actually added to a payout transaction. Um, at the current bridge behavior, it emits the event whenever the ad signature event is, uh, the ad signature method is called. And sometimes the signature may not be valid or maybe the transaction is already signed, so there is actually no signature added and the event is still emitted. So that, that can be a bit confusing. Uh, the proposal is to only ensure that the event is emitted when the signature is added. Uh, but that's, that's all. 
Thank you, I would like to, to remark something about this RSKP in particular, which is that I recall having conversations with different partners and, and even internal developers about the, the complexity of tracking what is the status of a given payout and the anxiety that users may end up having for the process that is kind of long, right? We are talking about uh, 34 hours for a payout to be processed. So this is a, an effort put on simplifying the development of tools to track the status of a payout. And, and by the way, uh, just to spoil a little bit, uh, recall that we have a two API application uh, developed and launched with the payout functionality. And this is part of what we consider is important to be improved on. So I think this is a, an error escape that should be adopted. Thanks, uh, I have a question, if I may. Um, sure. What's how do you distinguish the, the the previous event from the new event? Like for the length of this field, or there is another way to 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 make sure you you don't mistake uh, the hash for the the uh, the address. You mean the release request received event? Yes. Uh, uh, it's actually the same event. Now it changes how it's emitted. Okay. So if so I if I'm writing an application, uh, how how do I know that the the format changes by the block number or the size of the field would change in, in some way? Uh, I guess that the safest way will be the block number. When finger root activates, you will have a new signature. Okay. Yeah, but the, the length also changes because uh, it was a hash 160, so 20 bytes, and now it's going to be the, the base 58 address, right. uh, which I recall correctly was 23 bytes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good. It makes it, makes it easy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. I think this interaction uh, is pretty good. Like it's, it's good to have these things discussed in life. Um, just to uh, move over, um, are we done with this one? Would you like? Would you guys like to ask anything else here? Mm, I see no comments, so let's no just take it to the next one. Sorry, no, no questions in the chat. Um, no, no, I see no questions for now. Okay, okay so let's move over to RSKP three seven four, Jose. I think this one is yours. Right. Okay, I get this one. So. Um, Adrian was mentioning earlier that in the past consensus change, we uh, had to make, a, I mean, there was a need to fix um, an issue. So let's recap a little bit on that. Uh, with Hop, Rustock introduced the ERP, the emergency recovery protocol for the Pope, which made a change in the reading script. This new reading script introduced a, a really important security feature, uh, giving the opportunity of recovering the funds if there was any fatal failure with the pegnatories. The problem is that this feature came with, with an issue, which was that the redeem script used for the ERP was considered as non-standard because of a limitation of the Bitcoin kernel. Uh, there was a lot of analysis when put on, on this. As Adrian mentioned, there was a halt on the pegout process. And after the fix was made, uh, and after the activation of uh, 41X, we had two releases, 410 and 411, uh, a pop change was made, moving the funds to a now standard reading script. Um, this process required an extra time for the migration. Uh, we, the, the, the migration has a, a duration, and for this, it needed to be extended. The reason for this was that miners require additional time to verify and accept these non-standard migration transactions. At the time being, the migration was extended to 172,800 restock blocks, which was about two months. After this period, and after uh, verifying that all the funds were back in a standard reading script, the payout was resumed. So right now, there is no need to have long-standing migrations. Uh, having two months of migration means that the POPE cannot be changed during those two months. Therefore, this proposal is to roll back to the, the original migration duration, which is, as it states in there, 10,585 blocks, which is about four days. Uh, for the migration itself, for the migration stage, no further change is required, 
but stay tuned because there is one more SKP that will share some proposal for this. And that will be it. Awesome. Thanks, Jose. Uh, yeah, ju well. ju just uh, may, may I interject one thing, uh, guys? Um, so I mentioned that uh, this RSK ID was, was quite relevant, probably the most relevant one in, in finger rules. Uh, to resume like normal pulp composition changes, just um, to clarify something, it's not that those uh, cannot be done today, but uh, it could require these 172,000 blocks uh, to, to happen before a new one can be done. Uh, of course, these pulp composition changes do not happen that often, uh, so probably doesn't look uh, that bad, but under certain circumstances, uh, the, the the community might want or might need to do a a, um, a, a change, and um, if that happens in between uh, a couple a couple composition change is triggered and these uh, two month periods, uh, it won't uh, it won't be possible uh, until these RSK IP is activated, basically, and 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 goes back to the normal or well, the previous value of uh, 10,000 and something blocks. So uh, yeah, just to clarify that it's it's not that it cannot be done today. It must uh, open the possibility of not being able to do that if it's within the, the migration period of uh, two months, uh, which is the current uh, estimated uh, time to, to uh, for immigration to be completed. Yeah, and, and to highlight again, this is going back to the original migration duration. It's not that we are proposing any, any specific change. It's yeah. given the incident was solved, it is time to go back to normal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, guys. So moving over, we have uh, three, seven, four. Oh, wait, <laughs> it didn't move. Uh, we have 375. Marcos, this yeah. one is yours. I think I'm going to be presenting this one. Am I right, Marco? Yes, yes, we did a change. Oh, sure. That's minute change. So we, yeah, I have no worries. No worries <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry for that. No, no worries. So the, the, this is a that has a huge name, a huge description. So let me repeat a little bit what Marcos described a little bit earlier about the payout stages. So the payout consists on several steps, right? First of all, uh, users send funds to the bridge requesting a payout. Then after some time, the bridge creates a payout. Let's recall that uh, since Hop we have the payout batching. This means that at most every three hours, the bridge will pack all the payout requests in queue and creating a Bitcoin transaction requesting those funds be moving away from the OPE. Once a payout is created, it requires 4,000 confirmations. Once it is confirmed, the payout authorities will start providing the signatures. And finally, when we have uh, the half of the payout authorities plus one signatures, the, the bridge will pack them all and broadcast the, or request the broadcast of the, the payout. These are SKP proposes uh, something that we need to focus on the on the signing process. For the payatories to sign a payout, they are using the PoHSM. This PoHSM, it's a hardware security module customized for a uh, restock, which requests or requires for the payatory to not only request a signature, but also to provide the evidence that the Bitcoin transaction to be signed was created by the bridge. And for this to happen, the payatories need to provide the evidence looking up when the Bitcoin transaction was created in the bridge. This is a time consuming process that some time ago we mitigated by adding a local storage index or cache in the POPEC node, linking this Bitcoin transaction with the root store transaction. But this mitigation had its own issues. For instance, a local storage file, a local file could be corrupted. It is not part of blockchain, it's off chain. And this will end up rendering the pegnatory unable to sign a payout. At the same time, in the bridge, uh, the storage already holds all the data. The only thing that we are missing here is 
linking or a key linking the Bitcoin transaction and the Rooster transaction. So in the end, what are we proposing with this RSKP? To change one of the keys in the, in the payout process in the bridge, the one that stores the payout to be signed, to match the RSK transaction hash where the payout was created with the Bitcoin transaction. Having this linked already in the storage, it will simplify a lot the process in the Popec node. Having simply an O1 lookup in the Popec node to fetch the evidence of a rooftop transaction that created the Bitcoin transaction that we will request to be signed. So again, this is a, a simple change that will have a huge impact and improvement in the signing of the payouts. I don't know if there's any question, comment. I, yes. I would like to add something here. Yeah, sure. Um, why, why we can do this now and we didn't do it before, it's related to what, what Jose was mentioning that during the past uh, network upgrading hub, we included payout batching feature. So th this feature uh, takes all the payout requests and every approximately three hours, creates a single payout transaction that includes all the, the requests. So this ensures that we, uh, we have a single payout creation transaction uh, for all the payouts. Before that feature, we could have multiple payout transactions created in the same RSK uh, transaction and that would result in, in duplicate keys. So, this is part, since we have this improvement in hope, this is like a, an extra improvement to for, to make the, the payout process more, more secure, fast. Thank you, Marcos. That was an important remark. And, and I think that partially as, uh, answers a question we have in the, in the comments, but uh, oh. something else. So they are asking what's the benefit of batching payouts and how often do these batches happen? Um, okay. So the benefit, uh, there are a couple, but the main benefit for users is that the cost of a payout is spread through them. That's one benefit, a, a huge adoption uh, improvement. And also, as Marcos was saying, given that now we are including all these payouts in a single transaction, it's simpler for the for the whole process. And how often it happens? Every uh, three hours, around three hours. I don't recall exactly the number of a result blocks that this means. Marcos, I don't know if you recall. Yeah, it's, uh, 360 blocks, uh, approximately three hours if we consider a block every 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I may add that apart from the convenience and usability uh, benefits of, of reducing the cost of peg out, one of the main reasons was uh, security related, uh, that uh, there was a potential attack where a user could create a lot of small size, like very tiny amounts of peg outs. And that would, you know, block the peg from, you know, having a viable enough UTXOs to serve the other users. So it could somehow be used for a kind of denial of service attack. So it was twofold. It, it's better for the user, but it's also a protection from, for security. Because now if we have a, a lot of peg out requests in the same three hours, we can serve them all by consuming a single UTXO. We don't have to consume uh, a lot of UTXOs for each individual request. Thank you, sir. That's very good. Thanks, guys. Yes, um, um, yeah. I think it sorry. also helps uh, with the power HSMs because now, now they only need to sign one transaction every three hour tops instead of having to sign multiple transactions. That is a, a resource consuming process. So that's another benefit. Nice, great. So I think we can move over to the next one. Um, Marcos, this one is yours. Okay, hello again. <laughs> um, well, to give some context here, um, since I think this was introduced in, in Iris, the Grow Upgrade, uh, the Rich started storing the last retired OPEG P2SH script. This is uh, intended to be able to identify migrations transactions um, 
that may, may attempt to be resisted after the migration age finished in the Pauper. So it will allow the bridge to identify those transactions as a migration sent from the last retired Pauper. Uh, so that covers a risk that we may have of maybe losing funds if for different reasons, uh, a migration transaction were to be registered late in the in the bridge. Uh, if we didn't have this feature, we, we risk losing those, those funds. Now with this feature, we can be able to identify properly as a transaction created from the last retired open and register it in the bridge. Um, so what we are doing is whenever, whenever there, there is a, a Pope composition change, uh, well, the, the last retired federation, p script is stored in the, in the rich storage. But this script is built from the complete reading script of the, of the Pope. And since uh, Hope, no, since I, sorry, the an emergency multi C was added. I, I think it was in RSKP two hundred and one. So this emergency multi C exists uh, like as a fail safe mechanism in case something terribly wrong or bad happened to all the PowerPoint and devices. Uh, it, it would allow uh, a group of signers to recover funds after one year has has passed since those UTXOs has have not been moved. Uh, well, this uh, this change in place some changes in the Pope reading script. It, it adds uh, another flow and the, the emergency multi C keys in it. And well, it created for a more complex reading script. There are other, there are also other different protocols. Uh, for example, the flyover protocol that add some new opcodes on top of the existing Pope reading script to do certain operations. Um, so that, that creates a new address and that allows to identify transactions that are sent for that protocol and provides other use cases. So this complicates a little bit uh, the bridge logic to be able to identify transactions that, that are sent for the pop peg because whenever, whenever you add new opcodes to the existing reading script, it's a, a new reading script, so a new p 2 script, a new address. So it, it adds a, a little bit of, of complexity identifying uh, the destination of, of those transactions. The proposal is in this RSKP is to simplify this, this whole process. And whenever the last retired PopEd reading script is stored. We only care about what we call the standard script. The, the standard reading script is basically the, the composition of the PopEd without the, the emergency part, without any other protocol of codes added, just the, the op M, the public keys of N and the op check multi C. So that makes it compatible for every different reading script protocol that may be created moving forward. And it simplifies the, the work of the bridge uh, identifying when a transaction was sent uh, to the OPEG address. That was kind of, I don't know if that was clear. Yeah, it was clear. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Marcos. Thank you for a thorough explanation. Hmm. Yeah. That. Um, yeah. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Any anything to add, or should we move over to the next one? Yeah, I see nothing in the chat. Sorry. Okay, let's just go to the next one. Next, we have three eight three by Sergio. Yes. So I think this is this is important because this relates to the evolution and the growing of, of Rustock as a platform to serve other protocols. Uh, when you when there is a migration, a change in the composition of the POPEC, there is a time that it's a, it's there is a forced delay 
so that any user of the Rootstock platform can know who's the, who's are, who are the new members of the POPEG and identify them and, and you know, do whatever they want. If they, if they disagree with the new composition of the POPEG, they can take their funds and go elsewhere, right? And this is very important to, to in any case, give any user the full uh, possibility to, to be in control of their funds. But since the growing of the Rustock, there are other protocols uh, in Rustock that they have their own uh, delays for unstaking funds. So currently the delay uh, for a federation change, uh, a migration of the funds and a change in the federation composition is about one week. Uh, but that we think that if there are other protocols that impose different uh, additional uh, restrictions on when you can release your funds, then at least we have to give more time for those users to fully be able to take the funds and go back to Bitcoin. Uh, so that's what we are increasing this time uh, from the, the day the, the, the proposal to have a new composition of the POPEG is made to the day that this actually activated is, is activated and, and, and the funds start migration we will have more blocks, more time for users to decide to do uh, what they want. And it's it will become uh, 4,000, about 4,000 block, which is, uh, uh, I think it's about two weeks. Uh, so yeah, that, that makes the system uh, protecting better the users and makes it also fair, more fair for users. Thank you so much, Sergio. Uh, is there, any question that you guys may have, uh, be it on the comments or be it here on the call? All right, good. All right, all right. So yeah, let's go over to the next one. And I think this one is Jose's. Yep. Yeah, so let's close with, uh, with the simplest one. So we already have this method in the bridge, get estimated fees for next payout event. As we mentioned, this relates to the payout batching the idea here is to give uh, systems users the opportunity to understand or to know beforehand how much we estimate or the bridge estimates that the next payout event will cost. Um, let's recall that uh, if we have only one request in a payout batching, that the user will be paying the cost of creating all the Bitcoin transactions, whether if we have 100 users and queuing their payouts, most likely that is going to be a cheaper out because the, the, the basic cost will be spread across the users and it's more, more likely that we will uh, consume less uh, UTXOs uh, per output, per pegout. Um, so this method simply returns, given the size of the queue, the cost of creating a basic or presumable uh, Bitcoin transaction for performing the payout for those um, requests. The issue we have here is that when there are no payouts in the queue, it's returning a zero. And this goes against the idea of a user understanding how much it will cost for them to include their payouts. So the proposal here is simply, when there are no payouts in queue, return the cost of a single payout. And this is going to be helpful for services, basically, or users that want to use the, the, the bridge. An example is a two API application uh, that is presenting the estimation of the payout to the users before they create a payout. And this is going to return a proper value instead of a zero. That's basically it. No, no additional data. I don't know if anyone has any question or comments. Uh, I think there's something that might be worth mentioning that this, this existing implementation of this method, if there are, for example, 10 payouts in the queue, and you will want to get the estimated fees for the next payout, it will estimate the fees for 11 payouts, right? So it, it that's one because the, the idea is that you get the estimated fees for how much a payout will cost if you add your payout. Not like the existing queue, but the existing queue plus yours. Exactly. Right? That, that's why if there are zero payouts in the queue, we want to estimate yeah, for one. one. Thank you, Marco. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you both for your inputs. And yeah, I think with that, we conclude the RSKIP's discussion and we can just go to the next session, which is the Q&A's. 
So we have a couple questions actually left unanswered. So let's go over for the first one. We have it here. So that, that is, could the time required for the pegouts be reduced? Um, I, I can give my, my, uh, my idea of why you could not reduce it a lot, but uh, you could at least half it. Um, so the, this is a security parameter that that involves uh, preventing um, invalid pegouts and making sure that there is an enormous amount of hash rate uh, supporting uh, these pegouts, which means that these pegouts have been validated by the full uh, RSK mining network. Uh, but uh, there is a proposal, and I think that uh, it's it's if it's not already implemented, uh, maybe Jose can, can tell us more. Uh, that is for HSMs to recognize the proof of work that is being uh, provided by the uncle blocks, which currently is left out of the of the out of the computation. So once that additional hash rate is used uh, to back up. This, this amount of hash rate, then probably we could reduce at least uh, maybe 20, 30, or 40 percent the amount of, uh, of blocks required for, for big out. This is a, an idea. Uh, it's, it's not something that we, we have an RSKIP for, but it, it, it could be done once we can make sure that the device is it's, uh, validating more proof of work that actually exists in the Rootstock blockchain. Uh, to answer Sergio, yeah, the Popec team led by Marcos is working with the help also of the, the HSM team on having this feature integrated in the Popec node. So, yeah, uh, and as Sergio mentioned, this is not a consensus change. This introduction of the, the ankle hashing power in the HSM and, and the, Pope, the Popec node using it, this is not a, a consensus change. Therefore, there is no escape at the moment. And something yeah. else to to also. I I, I is. sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Jose. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You will know better than me. But I believe that this it's already uh, implemented on the HSM pure, uh, right? Mm. I think it was Jose. Look, what I I, I can answer. <laughs> Yes, this is okay. implemented in the, in the in the HSM side. Uh, at the the Popec team, we are working on for making use of this new feature. Um, yes, the, the idea is to make sure that the, it works as, as expected. That the anchors are accumulating enough difficulty. Um, yeah, uh, once we have everything in place and we know it works as expected, we may consider reducing the the amount of log confirmations needed for a, a payout to be confirmed. That, to be clear, that is uh, a consensus change because that, that's a value that uh, hard coded in the in the bridge. So it's currently 4,000 blocks in, in mainnet. Reducing that value is, is in, in fact, a, a consensus change. Nice. Thank you, Marco. Sorry for my connection. Wanted to mention that there's also an upcoming um, feature that could help with the reduction of the, the time for a pegout, which is a flyover pegout. This is not ready yet, it's not um, available, but I think that that would be an, an additional option for users until they have the possibility of the native pegout taking less time. Yeah. I think that once flyover pickouts are act, are used by the users and available to the users, uh, there, 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 maybe there is no more need to to accelerate the normal pickouts ever. Hmm, that's true. So yeah. yeah, thank you everyone for your inputs here. Uh, we can go over the next question now then, uh, which is I'll show it on screen now. Uh, for RSK AP 252, are transactions with invalid gas price rejected by the nodes and not broadcasted? What happens if one of these TX is included in a block? Are they accepted? Okay. Yeah, uh, they are not broadcast, 
uh, and and they are not accepted to be included in the block. So a, a miner, if it's running, obviously the, the latest version will not uh, take this transaction and put it in a block. And if it's put in a block, then the block becomes invalid. So so yeah, better they are upgraded uh, to 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 make sure they they don't produce invalid blocks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sergio, for your input. Uh, hi, Mortal. Welcome. Um, yeah, uh, I think we have one more question. I don't, I don't know if you guys want to take this one. I'll put it on screen real quick. I think this falls a little bit out of current, uh, let's say, uh, let's just read it out, see what happens. When are we going to get a swap bridge for DOC and USDT? I think currently, for example, it kind of falls, how to, how to say it, probably not currently a way to do that. And as for when it will happen, I think it's, there's no specific time when it will happen, basically. Uh, do you guys have any input that you guys would like to share here? Uh, this, this is more a, a user level, you know, uh, project. This is not a core uh consensus change. So here we discuss uh, what re is related to the consensus changes. So maybe you can ask that on on some of the Rustock channels and, and probably people for, that are working on that particular project can, can answer that. Hmm. That's true. Something like a swap or an exchange probably would have a better idea of when something like this can be implemented. That's true. All right, uh, please, if there is any questions, make sure to post them now. Uh, otherwise, we can move over to the next section. Um, let's give it just 20, 30 seconds in case there's any more questions regarding the RSKPs uh, discussed previously. Otherwise, let's just move on. You're welcome, consultas. Uy. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, if you guys want to uh, want to get involved, uh, please make sure to join the Rootstock Open Slack at developers.rsk.co/slash/slack. Ask your questions in the research and innovation uh, channel within the Open Slack. Uh, join the Rootstock Research Forum at research.rsk.dev. Propose your own RSK APs and discuss the existing RSK APs. This can be done using the public repos, which we can find below uh, RSK Smart, uh, uh, github.com slash RSK Smart slash RSK APs and ips.rootstock.io. I will be sharing these links on the, uh, on the description box below. Uh, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Oh, I see we have one more question actually. So maybe we can go back there. Uh, we have from GML, we have with the proposed RSK AP specifically 252, should users expect a significant, a significantly lower transaction fee and what percentage decrease in transaction fees is expected? And no, the, the users won't notice anything. It's not a proposal to reduce the transaction fees. It's actually a proposal to prevent paying uh, mistakenly high transaction fees and reducing the attack surface for certain very, very specific uh, denial of service attacks. So for most users, this is uh, nothing to worry about. It's just a protection. Yeah, but it, it does not lower the transaction fees if I understood correctly the question. Thank you so much, Sergio. So yeah, I think with that, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Uh, thank you, Jose. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Adrian, for joining us today. And thank you thank all you. for all of your inputs. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thanks, thank you everyone. Thanks, Thanks, Anthony. Thank you all. Have all right. a nice day. See you next time. Have a nice day, everybody. See you, See you around. Bye-bye.